The eschatological relevance of Leviathan and Behemoth is jaw-dropping. Does this ancient duo have a binary role to play in days to come? You definitely want to stay tuned for this. The concept I'm going to present to you in this video is going to be a hard pill to swallow. However, I do believe that the evidence is insurmountable and more importantly, scriptural. I adjure you to be a Berean by testing these things to the scriptures to see if they line up with what the Father has spoken to his faithful prophets. Even though Leviathan and Behemoth are seldom mentioned in the Western Canon of 66, there is enough content to build the case that these two beasts were formed during the creation week and for a latter day's purpose. I will be referencing several extra-biblical texts, texts that I believe were removed with sinister intentions, for the purpose of reinforcing my argument along the way. Because I believe that context is king, let's start at the very beginning and build a solid foundation for what this video will reveal in the end. Trust me, you'll want to see why our creator fashioned Leviathan and Behemoth in the first place. Then God said, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarmed after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. There was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. That's found in Genesis chapter 1, 20-23. Verse 21 says that God created the great sea monsters on day 5 of creation, and the Hebrew word for sea monster is tanin, and means a marine or land monster, that is, a sea serpent or a jackal. It can be a dragon, a sea monster, a serpent, or a whale. Jubilees 2.11 says, And on the fifth day he created great sea monsters in the depths of the waters, for these were the first things of flesh that were created by his hands, the fish and everything that moves in the waters and everything that flies, the birds, and all their kind. It's interesting to note that the great sea monsters were the first creatures of flesh that Yahweh created. 2 Ezra 6, verses 47 to 52 says, On the fifth day thou didst command the seventh part, where the water had been gathered together, to bring forth living creatures, birds, and fish. And so it was done. The dumb and lifeless water produced living creatures as it was commanded that therefore the nations might declare thy wondrous works. Then thou didst keep in existence two living creatures. The name of one thou didst call Behemoth, and the name of the other Leviathan. And thou didst separate one from the other, for the seventh part where the water had been gathered together could not hold them both. And thou didst give Behemoth one of the parts which had been dried up on the third day, to live in it, where there are a thousand hills. But to Leviathan thou didst give the seventh part, the watery part. In 2 Ezra 6.42, Ezra states that, On the third day thou didst command the waters to be gathered together in the seventh part of the earth. Six parts thou didst dry up and keep, so that some of them might be planted and cultivated, and be of service before thee. According to Ezra's creation account, our earth is divided into seven sections. Six sections were dried up on the third day, and the seventh section is where the waters under the firmament were gathered into. This seventh part where the waters had gathered together could not hold both Leviathan and Behemoth, so they were separated. Leviathan was given the seventh part, the watery part, and Behemoth? And thou didst give Behemoth one of the parts which had been dried up on the third day, to live in it, where there are a thousand hills. That's in 2 Ezra 6.51. Where there are a thousand hills? Hmm. That's shrouded in familiarity. Check out what the psalmist has to say. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. That's in Psalm 50 verse 10. The word for cattle in the Hebrew is behemoth, and corresponds with the same word in Job chapter 40 verse 15. Could 2nd Ezra 6.51 be winking at what was recorded decades earlier in Psalm 50 verse 10? Personally, I believe so. 
Wherever these thousand hills are located on this mysterious earth of ours, Behemoth seems to be occupying them. And on that day where two monsters parted, a female monster named Leviathan is well in the abysses of the ocean over the fountains of the waters, but the male is named Behemoth, who occupied with his breast a waste wilderness named Duduain, on the east of the garden where the elect and righteous dwell, where my grandfather was taken up, the seventh from Adam, the first man whom the Lord of Spirits created. And I besought the other angel that he should show me the might of those monsters, how they were parted on one day and cast, the one into the abysses of the sea, and the other into the dry land of the wilderness. And he said to me, Thou son of man, herein thou dost seek to know what is hidden. That's found in 1st Enoch 67-10. Noah, the one narrating this chapter in 1st Enoch, expounds on the same event that Ezra recorded, but with some added details. The dry wilderness that Behemoth was brought to is named Duduain, and was located to the east of the garden that was planted in Eden. We are told that on the same day that Leviathan and Behemoth were created, they were also separated from each other. Think about the sheer magnitude of these creatures for a second. They were separated from each other because the seventh watery section couldn't accommodate the both of them. In the Apocalypse of Abraham, Abraham was taken to the highest firmament, the seventh heaven, where the Most High resides and was shown some incredible things from the very perspective of where the Father looks down upon the circles of the firmaments and upon the circle of our earth plane. Apocalypse of Abraham chapter 21 verses 3 to 5 says, And I saw beneath the surface of my feet, even beneath the sixth heaven, and what was therein, and then the earth and its fruits, and what moved upon it, and its animate beings, and the power of its men, and the ungodliness of some of its souls, and the righteous deeds of other souls. And I saw the lower regions and the perdition therein, the abyss and its torments. And I saw the sea and its islands, its monsters and its fishes, and Leviathan and his domain, his camping ground and his caves, and the world which lay above him, his movements and the destructions of the world on his account. And I saw there the streams and the rivers, and the rising of their waters, and their windings in their courses. Abraham got a sneak peek of Leviathan in his domain. So far, the descriptions we are given of Leviathan's location is that he dwells in the watery caves and abysses of the sea, and that the world lays on top of him. Leviathan's movements create destruction on the world that lies above him. Think about that one for a second. Not only do I think that there is an eschatological movement to come, but he may have been moving below us all throughout human history, bringing about various earth tremors. The psalmist writes, O Yahweh, how many are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. There is the sea, great and broad, in which are swarms without number, animals both small and great. There the ships move along, and Leviathan, which you have formed to sport in it. That's Psalm 104, 24 to 26. Now, on to the book of Job. Monsters exist. This book is simply amazing. No other piece of Holy Spirit inspired literature provides us with the kind of details that we are about to read here in Job, starting with Behemoth. Behold now, Behemoth, which I made as well as you. He eats grass like an ox. Behold now, his strength is in his loins, and his power in the muscles of his belly. He bends his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are as tubes of bronze. His limbs are like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. Let his maker bring near his sword. Surely the mountains bring him food, and all the beasts of the field play there. Under the lotus plant, he lies down in the covert of the reeds and the marsh. The lotus plants cover him with shade. The willows of the brook surround him. If a river rages, he is not alarmed. He is confident, though the Jordan rushes to his mouth. Can anyone capture him when he is on watch? With barbs, can anyone pierce his nose? That's in Job 40, 15 to 24. Traditional thought is that Behemoth is either a hippopotamus, elephant, rhinoceros, or a buffalo. 
The physical characteristics of said animals don't seem to pair up with the descriptions that Yahweh imparts to Job. I mean, Behemoth's tail is said to be like a cedar tree. I think we should be taking that description seriously. We have no reason not to. If Behemoth is simply a hippopotamus, then there would be no need to separate him from Leviathan. Remember, they were separated from each other because the seventh part of the earth where the waters were gathered into wasn't spacious enough to shelter both of them. Some have speculated that Behemoth may have been an Apatosaurus or an Argentinosaurus, which would match the descriptions better. But by saying that, they have left him in the past and cast him into the bin of extinction. I, however, believe he is alive. It's alive! Now Leviathan. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook? Or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many supplications to you? Or will he speak to you soft words? Will he make a covenant with you? Will you take him for a servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird? Or will you bind him for your maidens? Will the traders bargain over him? Will they divide him among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hand on him. Remember the battle. You will not do it again. Behold, your expectation is false. Will you be laid low even at the sight of him? No one is so fierce that he dares to arouse him. Who then is he that can stand before me? Who is given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. I will not keep silence concerning his limbs, or his mighty strength, or his orderly frame. Who can strip off his outer armor? Who can come within his double mail? Who can open the doors of his face? Around his teeth there is a terror. His strong scales are his pride, shut up as with a tight seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They clasp each other and cannot be separated. His sneezes flash forth light and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning torches, sparks of fire leap forth. Out of his nostrils smoke goes forth as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals and a flame goes forth from his mouth. In his neck lodges strength and dismay leaps before him. The folds of his flesh are joined together, firm on him and immovable. His heart is as hard as a stone even as hard as a lower millstone. When he raises himself, the mighty fear, because of the crashing, they are bewildered. The sword that reaches him cannot avail, nor the spear, the dart, or the javelin. He regards iron as straw, bronze as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned into stubble for him. Clubs are regarded as stubble. He laughs at the rattling of the javelin. His underparts are like sharp potsherds. He spreads out like a threshing sledge on the mire. He makes the depth boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a jar of ointment. Behind him he makes a wake to shine. One would think the deep to be gray-haired. Nothing on earth is like him, one made without fear. He looks on everything that is high. He is king over all the sons of pride. It's in Job 41, 1-34. I think it suffices to say that Leviathan isn't described as an ordinary creature. No monster on earth matches Edith's descriptions, which makes him simply unique. As Yahweh told Job, nothing on earth is like him, one made without fear. Interestingly, Yahweh asks Job if Leviathan will make a covenant with him in verse 4. I won't elaborate in this video, but keep an eye out for the New Covenant Inauguration where I will include and expound upon some of the content of this presentation in that video. In verse 6, Yahweh asks Job if the traders will bargain over him and if he will be divided up among the merchants. Keep this in mind for what I will briefly discuss later in the video. Verse 25 says that, When he raises himself up, the mighty fear, because of the crashing, they are bewildered. Remember what the Apocalypse of Abraham 21 verse 4 said? how the world lays above him, and that when he moves, it creates destruction. It's evident to me that he is a fire-breathing creature, and nothing on earth can harm him. 
How does one make the depths boil like a pot, or make the sea like a jar of ointment, if they aren't associated with the power of fire? What a terrifying creature, indeed. The following verse will reveal the name of the angel that is in charge of restraining Leviathan. For more information about the various roles of this particular angel, look out for the video titled Entertaining Angels, Restrainer Identified, in the Entertaining Angels series. Apocalypse of Abraham chapter 10 verse 10 says, I, Jawel, am ordered to restrain the Leviathan, for every single attack and menace of every single reptile are subject unto me. Jael is an extremely powerful angel and has been given direct orders from Yahweh to keep Leviathan restrained. I'm not entirely sure how that has worked since the beginning of creation, but it appears that Leviathan is let loose on the ever approaching day of the Lord. Though they hide on the summit of Carmel, I will search them out and take them from there. And though they conceal themselves from my sight on the floor of the sea, from there I will command the serpent and it will bite them. That's in Amos 9 verse 3. Leviathan is also referred to as a serpent and a dragon in Isaiah 27 verse 1, a verse we will be seeing shortly. It appears that men will try to hide from the hour of trial that will be coming upon the earth on the day of the Lord, but at Yahweh's bidding, Leviathan will open the doors of his face so as to release the terror that are around his teeth. This passage as we see back in Job 41, verse 14. Job 41, 25 to 29 says, When he raises himself up, the mighty fear, because of the crashing they are bewildered. The sword that reaches him cannot avail, nor the spear, the dart, or the javelin. He regards iron as straw, bronze as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned into stubble for him. Clubs are regarded as stubble. He laughs at the rattling of the javelin. The mighty will fear the rise of Leviathan and will be totally inept as to inflict him with their weaponry. The Apocalypse of Abraham chapter 21 says, And I saw the sea and its islands and its monsters and its fishes, and Leviathan in his domain, his camping ground and his caves, and the world which lay above him his movements, and the destructions of the world on his account. Not only has Leviathan created destruction on our world in times past, but as has already been alluded to, his restrainer will let him loose for the purpose of wreaking havoc on the earth in days to come. For those who do not experience the first resurrection on the day of the Lord, fear not. Yeshua and his mighty warrior angels will be dealing with both Leviathan and Behemoth in merciless fashion. He is the first of the ways of God. Let his maker bring near his sword. That's in Job 40 verse 19. This is compelling because we see here that Behemoth was the very first creature made by Yahweh and that by the sword of his maker, he will come to an end. Check out what the Subtuagent has to say about this same verse. This is the chief of the creation of the Lord, made to be played with by his angels. Don't be fooled by the word played here. Yahweh's host of mighty ones will be doing much more than that with Behemoth. Isaiah 27 verse 1 says, In that day the Lord will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, with his fierce and great and mighty sword, even Leviathan, the twisted serpent, and he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. The context of that day, at the beginning of this passage, finds itself surrounded by the events that take place on the day of the Lord the most important and talked about day as seen in all of the writings of the prophets. Once again, we see that these beasts will be dealt with by the sword of our God, wielded by his agent of salvation, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, and their mighty hosts of war angels. And again, you divided the sea by your strength. You broke the head of the sea monster in the waters. You crushed the head of Leviathan. That's in Psalm 74, verses 13 and 14. The Septuagint words the next passage of Job 41, verses 24 to 25 in a slightly different way than the prior rendition that I read out of the Masoretic text. It says, There is nothing upon the earth like to him, formed to be sported with by my angels. 
He beholds every high thing, and he is king of all that are in the waters. According to the Septuagint, Leviathan was formed to be sported with, or hunted, by Yahweh's angelic armies. The last phrase in this version makes more sense in that Leviathan is the king of all that are in the waters, as opposed to being king over the sons of pride, which is found in the Masoretic rendering of the same verse. Remember how I remarked that you'll want to stay with me until the end of this video? The following passages reveal the ultimate reason as to why these monsters were formed and concealed in the first place. And it shall come to pass when all is accomplished that was to come to pass in those parts, that the Messiah shall then begin to be revealed, and Behemoth shall be revealed from his place, and Leviathan shall ascend from the sea, those two great monsters which I created on the fifth day of creation, and shall have kept until that time, and then they shall be for food for all that are left. That's in 2 Baruch chapter 29 verses 3-4. to Second Ezra's chapter 6 verse 52 says, And thou hast kept them to be eaten by whom thou wilt and when thou wilt. Psalm 74 verses 13 to 14 says, You divided the sea by your strength. You broke the head of the sea monster in the waters. You crushed the head of Leviathan. You gave him as food for the people of the wilderness. The Septuagint version of that same passage says, Thou didst establish the sea in thy might. Thou didst break to pieces the head of the dragon in the water. Thou didst break to pieces the head of the dragon. Thou didst give him for meat to the Ethiopian nations. And finally in 1st Enoch chapter 60 verse 12 it says, And the angel of peace who was with me said, These two monsters are by the power of God prepared to become food, that the punishment of God may not be in vain. There you have it folks, Leviathan and Behemoth were created to become food for the surviving nations of Yahweh's wrath which takes place on the day of the Lord. How merciful and gracious is our God. From the beginning of creation he knew the end and that there would be a devastated earth system in need of being renewed. He also knew that there would be surviving nations who would choose not to fight against Yeshua and his angels at their coming, and like a loving father, made food preparations for them well in advance. God truly is love. This is what Yahweh has instructed for us as humans to eat as it pertains to the beasts of the field. Leviticus 11 verse 3 says, Whatever divides a hoof, thus making split hoofs, and choose a cud among the animals, that you may eat. Not much is said about behemoths except that he eats grass like an ox, as found in Job 40 verse 15, and that the mountains bring him food, as per Job 40 verse 20. My speculation is that Behemoth is considered to be a clean beast according to the standards laid out in Leviticus 11. The father abides by his own law, meaning that he won't feed people unclean meat. This is what God has instructed for us as humans to eat as it pertains to what dwells in the waters. Leviticus 11 verse 9 says, these you may eat, whatever is in the water, all that have fins and scales, those in the water, in the seas or in the rivers, you may eat. We are told that Leviathan's strong scales are his pride, shut up as with a tight seal in Job 41 verse 15. It appears that Leviathan is considered a clean creature of the sea because of his scales. Brothers and sisters, Hollywood and its associated elite have knowledge about these creatures that our father has stowed away. There are many motion pictures that encapsulate this idea of gigantic monsters ascending from the depths of the sea or inhabiting remote islands. They, like us, have the original script, but instead had decided to tamper with the details and the overall message, which is par for the course for the movie making industry. As I have already stated a couple times in this video, Everything that was discussed is contextually situated on the Day of the Lord, the busiest prophetic day in all of human history. For more information about all of the events surrounding the Day of the Lord, feel free to check out a show I co-host called The Road to Rescue on the Parable of the Vineyard YouTube channel. 
It's a show that's devoted to presenting the context of the Day of the Lord from many different angles. As always, I hope that you've been blessed by this teaching, and remember to stay the course, finish the race of faith, and remain diligently hung upon his words.